Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, let's discuss the uh, processor fundamentals and uh, in process of that, we'll be discussing the one human model, the basic components of the processor that we are familiar with even today and how these things relate to each other. Eventually discussing the various aspects of your, you know, buses, how performance is effective and eventually finishing up at the fetch decode execute cycle. Now, let's look at the von Neumann model first. Uh, first of all, what happened before von Neumann came up with this process? Uh, basically, if you look at the basic structure of an instruction, each instruction is made of two parts. One is the opcode versus the operand. Now, the opcode portion of an instruction signifies what is to be done is basically represents what's required of this per current instruction and the operand portion refers to the data that will be used for this particular instruction so these two parts are necessary for completing an instruction opcode and an operand now before von neumann model was introduced these these instructions were executed by feeding your computer with the opcode separately and operand separately now, of course, as you can understand, that this will cause a very slow, uh, uh, you know, instruction execution process that you have to physically manually enter the op, uh, op code versus the operand separately when it's needed. And when Von Neumann basically introduced this concept that since the, the, the visual representation or the way the data is stored may be opcode or operand, there's no big, big difference. They're all ones and zeros. Then why not just put device such a storage area where all of this data can be placed collectively and fetched whenever they need it. So instead of us giving, you know, opcode and operand separately, and they're, they're visually, they're all ones and zeros. Why can't we put them together in the same place in the same storage device and all of the data being fetched when it's needed. And this a simple concept gave rise to what is known as the von Neumann and the stored program concept. So basic von Neumann model uh, should have the following principles. We'll look at those right now. Okay, first of all, all, all processors will have a central processing unit. There's a no brainer. All this, this is basically the whole concept that's running around it. Everything is controlled by the main central CPU. Uh, the processor has access to direct access to the memory. That is why your RAM, ROM, and cache are known as the primary memories because the CPU is accessing directly. The memory contains a stored program and the data that is used by the program, both of which can be replaced at programs at any time. So if you remember that memory, or let's just talk about the RAM, for example, it's volatile. It's got addresses and each, and these in individual addresses contain instructions. Now, the state of a memory can be changing because my memory, my operating system may decide to bring some other instructions into the previously stored ad addresses and bring something, uh, take something out of the memory, print something else in, in, in those addresses, so on and so forth. It's a constant process. So constantly the state of the memory is changing. So that's what's mentioned over here that the address that we're referring to right now contains one instruction at this particular moment and down the road it may contain some other instructions so it's a constantly changing process similarly as you can see as mentioned before the program and the data are both located in the address and this program meaning the opcode and the data meaning the operand both comp compose what becomes the instruction okay the stored program contains individual instructions the processor executes them sequentially all computers are sequential machines what that means is that all instructions will be executed in sequence, in sequence, unless there is some sort of jump instruction. All is, we'll be looking into that later, but all instructions are uh, executed sequence, sequentially. So as a programmer, it is our duty to make sure the instructions are written in sequence and the, se the, the sequence should reflect our intentional goal of the program. So if we mess up the sequence, the outcome will not be achieved and our, we, our goal will not be achieved. It will not be the, be the computer's fault because the computer does only one thing. It executes the instructions one by one. So sequence has to be made crystal clear by us. Any wrong sequence will result in a poor outcome of our results. The structure of most processors 
are very complex. However, the fundamentals can be outlined into that. Now let's look at the diagram first. Uh, and the details mentioned, I'll be sharing the link for the notes as well, but the details basically reflect around what's happening in this diagram. Now, this dotted line that you see here reflects the boundaries of our processor. So everything outside of this bound, this, this dotted line is not actually part of the processor. So as you can see here, we've got three buses and they're connected with the processor and they're leading outwards from the processor. Okay, we got two major processing unit, two major units when, uh, of our processor. One is known as the control unit and one is the arithmetic and logic unit. Let's look at the purpose of the control unit. As the name signifies, it's supposed to be controlling something. What is it controlling? In simple terms, it's controlling everything. Now, if we look into the details of what it's controlling, it's basically making sure that all instructions that are supposed to be carried out are carried out in sequence. And how does it ensure that instruction is carried out? Well, simply the control units is responsible for sending out control signals that ensure that a particular inst instruction is carried out by the hardware, connected hardware. So it sends out control signals to all parts of the computer to make, to make sure that all instructions are physically executed. So it could be a read command or write command. If you want to, for example, write something back into the memory, you can do that. If you want to read something from the memory, you can do that. Same thing if you want to write something with the hard disk, read something from the hard disk. All of this can be, have, it can be done just by the control signals passed out from this control unit. Apart from control signals, it is basically, you know, uh, making sure that all activities are synchronized. How it's, it's making sure they're synchronized by using two clocks. There are internal clocks, uh, and then there's the system clock. Internal clock represents the, the, the cycles of activities that are handled with inside the processor. And the system clock is maintaining the cycle of activities that are taking place outside the processor. Now, why do we have two different clocks for these uh, activities, internal and system clock? Well, internal clock obviously operates at a much faster rate because activities taking pl place inside the processor happen at a lot faster speed than activities happening outside the processor. So if I were to use the internal clock everywhere, even outside the processor, the devices that are connected, for example, the slow device, the printer, may not be able to keep up with the pace of the internal clock. However, if the system clock is being used, which allows for slower you know, activities to take place, most probably outside the processor, if I follow the system clock all over the computer, even inside the processor, that would mean my processor, which is capable of operating at much faster speed, is, busy, is basically waiting for you know, other things to happen. So waiting a processor, waiting for something, that's not a good approach. So that's why we keep two clocks to manage the internal activities as well as the external activities and both of these uh, uh, you know clocks are maintained by the control unit so and basically the uh, clock speed is basically the unit of work that each processor is capable of handling it defines the minimum time that separates two successive activities different processes are capable of handling different activities per second and that is their respective clock speed, and that is their unit of work. And this is basically how we measure how fast a processor is capable of you know, working. So 1.3 gigahertz processor would mean that that processor is capable of handling 1.3 you know, billion cycles per second, which is pretty fast. So anyway, these activities are handled by the control unit. Now let's look at the arithmetic and logic unit. As the name suggests that it understands the and handles the arithmetic operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and it also has the logical operations, handles the logical operations as well, such as and, or, XOR, stuff like that. So all of these relevant instructions end up being handled by the arithmetic and logic unit. Apart from these two units, the internal components are registers. As you can see here, we got few registers named here and some another diagram mentioning other registers. So if you look at what a register is, registers are divided into two broad categories. One are the specific purpose registers and one the others are general purpose registers. Now, the general purpose registers with the register we are gonna be discussing in our course is the accumulator register. And uh, it will be used extensively in the working of assembly language. We'll be looking into that later. However, these general purpose registers, basically, were, sorry, specific purpose register, what a specific purpose register means is that the purpose 
defined or the the contents of this register have a specific meaning and they have to be a, of a specific type we'll be looking at these at these individual registers in just a bit okay apart from these registers the control in the arithmetic logic unit we can see three buses attached to the processor control bus address bus and data bus uh, as mentioned before and uh, as you mentioned i remember from previous discussions as well bus is basically a is a channel is a communication channel it's not a storage device so basically these buses are capable of transporting data different types of data so we'll be looking in these in a bit too collectively these control bus address bus and data bus are collectively known as the system bus okay now let's look at the uh, register so as mentioned before there are two types general purpose which is the accumulator and special purpose which are these registers are very small holds very smaller that amount of data generally 16 32 or 64 bits so right now if say for example you're using a 64 bit processor most probably the registers will be of 64 bits as well now 64 bit that's not a lot of data so registers are holding very small amounts of data Apart from that, we've got uh, these specific purpose registers. We've got the current instruction register. The current instruction register is possible of holding the instruction that is about to be executed now. Now, the instruction will be forwarded to the control unit for decoding, so on and so forth. But it is handled, it, it, is, it holds the instruction that is to be executed now. The index register is basically will be used in index addressing the index at register and its use is discussed more in assembly language and but it is primarily used for index addressing index addressing and all other addressing modes are more detailed and more discussed in more detail in your uh, assembly language course then we got the memory address register basically it holds the address of the in, in data that will be accessed which is about to be accessed now to be accessed means that either i'm writing to that location or i'm I just read data from that location. So if I'm about to read something from some particular relation in the memory, the MAR will have the address of where I'm about to read from. If I'm write, about to write some data into the memory, the MAR will hold the address of where the data is to be written about now. So that's the purpose of the MAR. Okay, as mentioned here, I can allow for either that reading data from the location pointed out by the MAR, or I can write data to the location pointed out by the MAR. But the difference is how will my processor distinguish between the read and write operation? Well, this is where the control signals come in. The control unit will send out signals separately for read and write. And this is how the distinguish between distinguishing between these two operations takes place. Then we got the MDR, which is also known as the MBR, memory buffer register or memory data register. Now, obviously, the term buffer means that data, you know, we've got two devices which have very different, you know, you know, data access speeds and to accommodate the slower device or the faster device, we have a central temporary storage location, which is known as the buffer. Now the memory buffer register sort of operates in the same way. Now, but what the memory buffer or memory data register does is that it holds the data, not the address because MAR was holding the address. MDR holds only the data, which is, which was a just read from the memory or which is about to be written to the memory. Again, separated by the relevant control signals, the data that is about to be read or just, sorry, the data that was just read or is about to be written into the memory or from the memory is held in the MDR. So as mentioned before, it's specific purpose registers, the contents of these are very specific. The purpose of them are specific. They they can they, they tell a different story and they, they, they have a different meaning. And that meaning always is consistent, consistent. So MAR will always hold the address of the instruction uh, of the data that is just uh, and will that is will holds the address of the loca location where data is to be put or from where the data is to be read. MDR holds the address that is to be written or the address uh, or the data that is just read. Similarly, PC, program counter, holds the address of the next instruction, not what is happening right now, but next instruction. So if, for example, I am told, I, my M MAR gets the address from PC. So MAR starts handling that address in this cycle, but the PC is already ready for the next time the MAR comes to ask for the next assignment. So the PC is incremented every time 
and we will be looking at the, the fetch decode execute cycle for more details here. So basically the PC holds the instruction, sorry, holds the address of the next instruction. So once everything is wound up for this current instruction, the, the address in the P, PC will be used to follow up on the next instruction. Similarly, we got the final register, which is known as the status register. The contents of that status register are neither a data nor are they an address. They are flag bits. And specifically, we got three flag bits that are linking to the overall status of the instructions. Now, what the status register does exactly, we'll look at an example just to make that clear. Now let's try to understand the purpose of status register with respect to this example. As you can see here, I got two numbers. These are two positive numbers. This is 66 and 68. Now, when I add these two positive numbers together, my resulting number turns out to be negative. Actually, if you simply do bitwise addition, you will see that this is the resulting number 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, Zero 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 one one zero and one carry all the way here, resulting in this one over here. So I got if, if we look at the two's complement formation, this most significant bit is on. That means that this is a negative number. Now my status register will be capable of highlighting this error. I will know exactly this calculation cannot be trusted. Why? Because it turns out that originally my numbers were positive, and now my numbers are negative. Now the status register takes it makes use of three flag bits: the n bit, the v bit, and the c bit. The n represents the negative number. V represents whether or not an overflow has occurred. If a number is negative, the n bit will be on. If the overflow has occurred, then the v bit will be on. And the c bit represents a carry. A carry. If the carry is generated and possibly that carry generated and resulted in a bit that led out to the you know out of the range of bits allowed for the answer. So for example, if I have eight bits here, I've generated ninth bit in the carry bit and the overflow bit will be able to identify some situation there as well. Now, right now, this combination of N and B bits on will allow the processor to know that this calculation, this resulting answer is not correct. And it's quite obvious that my you know original numbers were positive. But the resulting number is negative because of which this is not possible and right here because of this the status bits held in my status register my processor will know not to trust this value not to further use this value this is wrong same thing goes with if for example i have these two numbers now as you can see here i've got negative 66 and negative 68 when I add these two numbers together, my resulting number will be 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. And this one is overflowed. This is not part of my register. This is not, this is bigger. This results in a number that is bigger than my register allowed uh, you know, length of bits. My register can hold only eight bits. This ninth bit will be outside. It will not be part of my data. Now the resulting number, as you can see here, is positive. The most significant bit seems off here. Even though my two added numbers were negative, the resulting number seems positive. Now, this particular situation will also be triggered by the combination of V and C bits this time. Now, if I have generated a carry, yes, which I did, and my resulting carry caused the number to overflow, and the number is no longer negative. It seems it's no longer negative. Now, these combination of bits are uh, signifying the processor that this value is also not to be trusted because is it is actually a wrong result. So the with the help of these status bits in held in the status register, we just witnessed two examples where a processor might successfully identified whether or not a wrong calculation has taken place. And once it has is capable of identifying the wrong calculations, it can halt that you know result right there and make sure that's not used for any further calculation because wrong calculations garbage that's in given as an input will result garbage that is resulting in an output garbage in garbage out processor any, any the computer is not at fault if you give it wrong values it will produce a wrong result so we want to prevent the wrong values being used any further and the status register helps in achieving that 
Okay, now let's look at the uh, system bus. Now, as you mentioned before, the system bus is a collective term that's given to the control bus, address bus, and data bus. Now, based on this diagram, we can see that the CPU is connected with all. Now, by the way, these memory and input output devices are these two combined present all of the devices of our computer, all of the devices. So memory obviously is the primary memory cache and your RAM and the ROM and so forth. And the input output devices include your keyboards, printers, screen, as well as your hard disk, everything. So basically these two terms, memory and input output devices, collectively they represent all the connected hardware to your computer. So CPU is connected with both of these categories of devices. So in, in short, CPU is connected with everything. So when we say that CPU is controlling everything, this is how it's done because it's connected to everything. Now the connection with is taking place with the CPU uh, with all of the other devices using these three buses. Now let's try to understand what's happening here. Now, as you can see here, this diagram shows the collectively the system bus the you know, control bus, address bus, data bus are collectively known as a system bus. Now my CPU is connected with the control bus and this control bus is connected with the memory and the input output devices, okay? But you see the, 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 the arrow that connects the CPU with the control bus is bi-directional. So that means is that the control bus is bi-directional. So data can be sent from CPU and can be received back to the CPU as well on the same channel. So this is a bi-directional bus. Now, just to make things clear, the CPU, when I'm connected, I'm going to mention this over here. So just to make things clear. When it comes to the control bus, this control unit is involved. When it comes to the address bus, MAR is involved. And when it comes to the data bus, MDR is involved. Now, how are they involved? Let's figure out. So first of all, let's look at the CPU. The CPU is connected with the control bus via its control unit. So basically the control bus links to the control unit. On one end of the control bus, we've got the control unit. On the other end, we got memory and IO devices. So when I say the control bus is connecting to the CPU, it is specifically connecting to the, sorry. Uh, when I say the control bus is connecting to the CPU, it is specifically connected to the CU control unit. It's not connected to anything else. It's connected to the control control unit. Okay, because control unit is responsible for sending control signals and control signals travel on the control bus. That's the purpose of control bus. So again, let's recap what, what the control bus does. Control bus is used for transmitting control signals in a bi-directional manner between the control units and the memory and IO devices. Bidirectionally, on one side we got control unit, on the other side we got memory and IO devices. Similarly, if we look at the address bus, as you can see here, address bus only has a one directional cable come, so this arrow coming here, and every other device only one direction. See? So what that means is the address bus is unidirectional. Now, what the address bus does is it transports addresses in a unidirectional manner between the MAR and memory and IO devices. So on one end of the address bus, we got the MAR, on the other end, we got memory and IO devices. Similarly, let's look at data bus. Now data bus like control bus has a bi-directional arrow and it's connected the bi-directional way with all other devices. So by that logic, my data bus transmits data, not addresses, not control signals, but data. Now that data can be anything. It could be values. It could even be addresses or it could be some, you know, some other, you know, data. So data bus, the data bus is used for transmitting data in a bi-directional manner between the MDR and the memory and IO devices. So that's these three buses collectively known as the system bus. So this text basically highlights that portion. Now let's discover what the purpose of ports are. 
Now, each I/O device is connected to an interface that's known as a port. We've got two part types of ports: internal ports and external ports. The in internal ports are used for connecting the integral parts of the computer, which are you know inside, whereas the external ports are used for connecting peripherals, mouse, keyboard, stuff like that. And each port is control is connected to a controller, which is known as device or I/O controller. The controller handle, handles interaction between the device and the e CPU. So basically, this is the purpose of your three buses. Okay, what happens to, you know, what happens? How is, how are the performance, how is the performance of your uh, system affected and what are the factors that affect the system performance now let's look at this since one clock cycle defines the shortest time that any action can take the clock speed is a very important factor governing the process speed of the system it is a fact that no components outside the processor can work as fast as the processor can the immediate access store ias components that can be directly accessed by the processor that means the cache or the memory there are collectively known as the ias and the rom as well accept or provide data to the processor at speeds at much slower than the process so obviously my cache even and ram despite being very fast storage devices they are nowhere close to the processor speed on its own modern cpus have become increasingly complex cpu chips are now multi-core with separate processes on each core. The increase in number of cores, the further factor that is used uh, of ca is cache memory as it is the fastest component of the IIS. Caches with, with increased storage and faster access rate play a large role in improving performance. However, for faster access, all of or part of the cache should be on the CPU chip. So as you can see here, my major factors with the system performance apart from clock cycles from clock speed we can have you know multiple cores so yes clock speed does matter but if we have more processes obviously the burden will also be you know increased or the word or, or the, the amount of work that a processor can do in unit time will also be increased similarly my cache which is uh, you know a, a, a central device in between my main memory the ram and the processor which is which holds the frequently used instructions, not the running program, but frequently used instructions. Now, if I have, say, a larger cache, and not, and not only is that cache large, it's actually, it's actually pretty close to the CPU. And in fact, it's not close; it's actually part of the CPU. If you have such a cache, then that can significantly increase the system's performance. Now, for address bus, address bus, a bus width means the separate wires of that bus. So either way, if it's address bus or data bus, the bus width means how many individual cables that each bus has. So for address bus, the bus width means the number of separate wires in the bus determines the maximum number of memory locations that can be addressed. For example, if we have a 16 bits bus, that means I can allow for 65,535 direct, actually 36, 65,536 direct addresses. So, if I have a 32-bit address bus, I can access a memory location of 4 billion app addresses. For larger memories, we can use special techniques. Now, what this means is that, this is, this is very important actually, what this means is that if, say, for example, I have a 32-bit bus and my memory addresses, each memory address is of 32 bits on, on its own. So that means if I were to be using address bus and I want to complete one complete address and I want to send that one complete address to the memory controller, for example, memory controller is by the way linked with the main memory. I'm going to send a complete address, a complete 32 bit address to a memory controller and each address is of 32 bits and I'm sending this address over a 32 bit channel that would mean that I am capable of sending a complete address in one cycle, in one go. Because I have a 32-bit channel, the address is 32 bits, I can send one complete ad address in one go. However, if say I have a 16-bit bus and I have a 32-bit memory, 32-bit address, that means that to complete a 32-bit address on my memory controller, my processor will have to take two cycles. 
because 30, 16 bits will go first, then the remaining 16 bits come after. So it is very important that if this, it, it's very important that this is taken into consideration that whenever my memory has to, or, or my processor has to transport an address that is larger than its bus width, it will require more than one cycle. So when you say that, okay, you want to make your you know, computer go faster and you have a four gigabyte memory right now, four gigabyte memory for a four gigabyte memory, each address will be 32 bits. That's, 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 that's known for four gigabyte, four billion addresses, four billion addresses, each address is 32 bits. Remember IPv4? IPv4 means 32 bits, four billion addresses. So in the same calculation here in the memory as well, if I have a 32 bit address, I'm allowing for a four gigabyte memory because I have four billion addresses. Now, if I have a four gigabyte memory and a 32 bit process, and you see, you, you want, you think it's not running enough uh, and you want to, you know, be able to play heavier games on it. Someone suggests you, why don't you go for an eight gigabyte memory? What that means is that now your memory address is greater than 32 bits. It's of 64 bits now. And without modifying your processor, you're causing your processor to do twice the work because now it has to complete a 64 bit address using a 32 bit bus. It will need two cycles. So it's not a good device to just to simply increase the memory. You will have to also go for a 64 bit processor. Now, however, you, you notice that 64 bit processor has is been, is, is been around for a long time. We always been we don't we don't necessarily see a 128 bit processor we are you still using up to 64 bits nothing more than 64 bit processor why is that the case well try to understand the motivation behind 32 bit to 64 bit processor for a 32 bit processor i can access at most a four gigabyte memory in a single cycle if it's a larger than 60 34 gigabyte memory then i will need two cycles to access and complete one address in a 32 bit processor Similarly, for a 64-bit processor, I can access in a single cycle, that 64 bits of address, I can access a memory that is up to 16 exabytes, which is a huge memory. So if I have anything above the 60, 16 exabyte memory, then my 64-bit processor will also require two cycles to complete a greater than one, so 128-bit address. But right now, since we don't have a 16 exabyte memory, 16 exabyte is pretty big. One exabyte is 1024 petabytes, one petabyte is 1024 terabytes, one terabyte is 1024 gigabytes. We're still in the gigabyte ter territory with respect to memories. So we're a long way to go. So that's why we still are using 64 bit processor. They are sufficient for accessing the current memories that we have. If we have something greater than 16 exabytes, then our processor will be needed to be beefed up as well. It will have, it will have to be brought up to 128 bit processes. Right now, it's enough. Similarly, as we can see that, you know, address, uh, you know, the, the, the number of bits that can be transferred over the address bits govern the size of the memory. Similarly, we have a word length, a term known as word length that is linked with the data bus. That simply means that how many bits of data can I transfer over on the data bus? So that's my word length. So if I have say, for example, 16, 16 wires, 16 wires, 16 channels, that means I can transfer two bytes of data simultaneously. So that is word length. So for database, that is word length. So this is basically the factors, you know, that govern the overall persistent performance and uh, very interesting stuff how we never realized these huge figures, but uh, they are actually pretty eye-opening. Now let's look at the universal serial bus. Now, as mentioned before, the buses, the system bus are parallel cables. So they use parallel data transmission. What parallel data transmission means that simultaneously multiple bits are being transmitted over multiple channels. Parallel data transmission has its own flaws, as we've seen before, that it causes for, you know, uh, data skewing over long distances, so on and so forth. So whenever I need long cables, uh, I, I do not opt for parallel cables because the longer the cable, the more chances of error can occur in the parallel cable. 
So if I have a serial cable, the chances of you know uh, corruption do not exist or data uh, error do not exist. Why? Because I'm sending one bit at a time over a single transmission line. So that is, uh, of course, that the speeds, the, the speed difference is drastic because it's the comparing one bit at a time versus some many several bits at a time. There's no comparison between them. But at times when you need to transfer data on peripheral devices, for example, then we will have to go for our serial data transmission. And now the most common serial data transmission cable that we see in modern day is the USB cable or the USB data transmission channel. So the USB transmission channel has ha had over very over the years many versions, many shapes and sizes. Currently, the most common and the most modern approach we see is the USB Type C. We are all are familiar with this. Basically, uh, the the reason the USB transmission is so popular is because of its plug and play technology. Now let's talk about plug and play. Connection connecting peripherals is a complex compl was a complicated task, and even uh, if you talk about how peripherals had to be installed, each device had to have its own uh, device driver. The, all hardware came with their equipped CDs, and you had to install device drivers from CDs. Now you don't. That's really very unheard of now. Now, if you buy a peripheral device, you just buy the peripheral device on its own. You plug it in your computer, and it, it installs the device driver installs on its own. You plug and play. Now, what happens is that the USB ports, uh, the plug and play technology was introduced to eliminate this complexity. USB ports are the underlying technology used in plug and play. Today, all peripherals are expected to use some version of USB at least. A computer can handle up to 127 different connected devices. They are configured and made available, made usable whenever the computer is turned on. Technology is evolving. USB is not a storage bus, storage device. So whenever we say that, give me that USB, I want to send you some data. That is not a USB. That is a USB flash drive. So that we we are so you know used to saying it USB that we think that USB is probably a storage device. No, that's a flash drive that connects to your usb port so usb flash drive but usb itself is just a data transmission channel it's a bus despite the widespread use of usb ports there are some peripheral devices that require a different port. one of the specialized for type or one that is specialized for the type of device although computer systems come packaged with a monitor or for screen display there is sometimes a requirement for a second screen to be used the connection for a second screen is can be through a video graphics port, VGA. Now we all are familiar with video graphics port. I will even show you a diagram uh, if I can find one. It provides high resolution screen display, which is suitable for most display requirements. However, the screen is needed to display a video. VGA port is not suitable because it does not transmit audio. For audio transmission, we have another version, which is known as HDMI, High Definition Multimedia Interface which will provide a connection to screen and allow transmission of high quality video including an audio component so we most computers used to come equipped with video graphics port as well as hdmi now you know as modern computers they are making use of type c to accommodate all different types of transmission so you just need the what you call it adapter and you connect to the type c and even the type c so type c, type -C has been you know, evolved to become a very versatile type of port capable of transmitting all sorts of data. Okay, as we were discussing this different ports, just a good, just give you an example, just to give you an example of what types of port exist. Uh, we got this is the uh, serial port that most computers come equipped with, the BGA port that we've mentioned here. This is what it looks like. Uh, okay. Yeah, I haven't mentioned this before, but you know, sorry, this one right here. This is the BGA port. Right here. Now, as you can see here, this picture's quality is not good, but this is what a VGA port usually looks like. And this is the each VGA port is serial. Now you might be wondering why do we need so many pins for a serial port? Well, these VGA ports have to have readings for red, green, blue, and uh, two other readings for horizontal and vertical, vertical frequency, as I think. And apart from that, we got these VGA ports are capable of connecting two devices. So that's why we need these many pins. And uh, most lap Mac was come equipped with this port right here. So these are different ports that are, okay, no mention of type C here. I'll just pop up a diagram for type C as well.
Okay, this is what the typical Type C arrangement looks like. It's it's got twelve pins on it, so that's why it has so much versatility in it because it's got individual pins, and the uh, you know the internet shows many versions of how these individual pins relate to data transfer. So basically, this is what a Type C looks like from inside. And uh, let's move on to the next part, which is fetch decode execute cycle. Uh, we've understood fetch decode. We've studied fetch decode execute cycle before as well. And uh, basically, the concept because behind fetch decode execute cycle is that it allows for it's the, it's the system that allows individual instructions to be fetched from the memory, decoded, and then executed. Now let's uh, let's look at uh, these steps one by one. Just quickly go through this. The fetch phase involves the address from the program counter to be transferred to the MAR. And during the next call cycle, two things happen simultaneously. The instruction held in the address pointed to the MR is fetched to the MD into the MDR. The address stored in the program counter is incremented by one. So if if you look at this system over here, this is known as the register transfer notation. Now, this register transfer notation identifies the fetch decode execute cycle very, very clearly. Now these, this is the PC, this is the MAR, this is the MDR, and this is the CIR, okay? Now, what does this these brackets mean? Let's try to understand what these brackets mean. This means that the contents of, now as we are aware that PC holds address for the next instruction, the address of the next instruction are currently the contents of PC. So this bracket, these hard brackets, these square brackets represent the contents of which PC. So the contents of the PC, which are address of the next instruction are transferred to the MAR. So that's what happens in the first part of my fetch decode execute cycle. Afterwards, in the next cycle, two things happen simultaneously. As it can be seen in the things mentioned in the same line, two things happen simultaneously. First thing is that the contents of PC are incremented by one. Why? Because now it has to point towards the next address. So obviously we, we've established this fact before that computers are sequential machines. So everything will be executed in sequence. So the next, the next thing that comes in sequence is the next address in the next location. So that's why my PC is incremented by one. Unless there's a jump state, then I'm simply executing line by line. So PC is incremented by one and the new address is stored in the PC. At the same time, now this is interesting. I've got two sets of square brackets over here. Now what this means? This means that the contents of MAR, which are an address, and the contents of that address are going to be some data. I repeat, the contents of MAR are an address, and the contents of that address are some data. And that data is to be sent to the MDR because MDR holds the data which is just read, which is just read. So that's why the contents of MAR which is the address and the contents of that address, which is the data is sent to the end. Now these two tasks, the, the data from the address in the MDR and the PC being incremented handles happens at the same time. Afterwards, when these two tasks are handled, the next thing is the contents of MDR are forwarded to the current instruction register. And this is basically your entire fetch phase that the contents of MDR end up at the CIR. After the CIR has the instruction, current instruction register has the instruction, this marks the end of the fetch phase. Now understand what happens with decode phase. Basically, the instruction is now in the CIR. And as mentioned before, the instruction is made of two parts, the opcode and the operand. My control units, will refer to the opcode portion of the instruction in CIR, only the opcode portion. And, and please remember that a format has to be defined for the instruction because 
like other factors as well, like we just studied for IP address as well, that I, if I don't know how many bits are for net ID and how many bits are for host ID, I will not be able to tell the difference between network and host. Similarly, for an instruction, a format has to be defined that how many bits are for the opcode and how many bits over the opcode. Only then will my computer be able to understand what is required to be done and what is the data that is to be used. So the instruction separation has to be mentioned here. So that's why CIR has that instruction. The processor is making use of a format and it will simply use the opcode portion of the instruction in CIR and use that thing, that opcode portion to decode the instruction. Now, basically what decode means is that it converts that instruction into micro instructions using its own firmware and its own, you know, the firmware located in, in, in its ROM. So the decode fit and, and, uh, involves the opcode portion of the in, instruction in the CIR to be sent to the control unit where it is decoded. And once it's decoded, the control unit will forward in control signals over its control bus to whatever necessary part of the computer it's needed for executing that instruction. And the ALU will be also activated if the instruction requires some arithmetic and logic processing. So again, the decode phase involves, we have we are done with the fetch phase and the fetch phase is end, comes to an end when an instruction reaches the CIR. Now the instruction is laid out in the CIR and my processor knows what part is the opcode, what part is the operand because of the defined format. It will take the opcode, it will decode the opcode, the control unit, by the way, the decode, the control unit will make use of the opcode portion, decode that instruction to micro instructions, and then it will proceed in sending control signals over the control bus to whatever part is needed at that moment for executing that instruction. And it will also involve the arithmetic logic unit if logic or arithmetic options are also being handled. And finally, we will discuss the execute state later on. By the way, I mentioned the execute state here because that's what the control signals are doing. It's executing uh, the instruction. Finally, this is the register transfer notation. We have uh, uh, mentioned this just a quick recap. What does the semicolon mean? When two operations are placed in the same line, separated by semicolon that means the two transfers take place simultaneously so if you're making use of a semicolon it means that these two uh steps are taking place at the same same time so when we have to make sure the semicolon is mentioned in this particular step here so this is the register transfer notation, notation. Uh, you'll be asked about questions uh, regarding this register transformation in your past papers as well in your exam as well finally let's discuss what an interrupt is Interrupt is a signal sent from a device attached to a computer. From It could be from a program or a different piece of hardware. And it causes the OS and CPU to stop what was doing and attend to the device or software that sent the signal. Today, all computers, large or personal, are interrupt driven, driven opposed to polling technique in which CPU wastes valuable clock cycles, prompting hardware or software if it needs services of the CPU. So as we all know, the CPU does handles everything. So one approach is the CPU asks all connected hardware as well as software if it needs anything to be done. And obviously this, will, this means that my CPU is wasting valuable clock cycles. As opposed to this, my CPU will follow the interrupt driven technique in which the CPU is doing something. And if some other compute hardware or software requires the CPU's instruction, it will simply send a, gen a signal, which is an interrupt signal, and the OS and the CPU will decide to stop this current instruction, save a state, and attend to the source of the interrupt, either software or hardware. So this is interrupt driven. Now with the interrupt are used all over computer, such as devices, as printers, or keyboard. Each keystroke that we make on a keyboard is an interrupt on its own. The interrupt service routine looks like this. Interrupts are handled, handled using the interrupt service routine. The operating system has smaller software component that is referred to as interrupt handler. Considering the following interrupt service routine for when a mouse moves. So for example, if a mouse is being used, this is what, these, are the step, these are the steps that are handled. First of all, mouse moves, okay? 
ये यू यू जस्ट स्लाइटली मूव इट ए हार्डवेयर चिप ऑन द मदरबोर्ड कॉल्ड एन इंटरप कंट्रोलर डिटेक्ट्स द माउस सिग्नल द इंटरप कंट्रोलर इश्यूज एन इंटरप सिग्नल एंड सेंड्स इट टू द सीपीयू अपॉन रिसीविंग द सिग्नल द सीपीयू कॉपीज इट्स रजिस्टर्स कंटेंट ऑन अ स्टैक लोकेटेड ऑन द मेन मेमोरी so that it can return to what it was doing after dealing with intro if this if this step is not taken care of then the cpu stops the current process and handles the intro but by the time it comes back to the process it left it will have to start from the beginning because it did not save its state so it has to save its state to make sure that once it comes back to that process it does not have to start from scratch and it can progress from there onwards it would be like if no nothing happened and the process was continuing from where it left off the cpu then starts executing the interrupt service routine by moving the cursor image to show the new to represent the new location on screen and also responding to any mouse clicks if any after the interrupt service routine is completed the cpu reloads the registers from the stack to carry on what it was doing before the interrupt so since its state was saved the cpu can proceed from the previous task without any loss of work it is the responsibility of interrupt handler to prioritize interrupts and arrange them in a queue while multiple interrupts are waiting to be dealt with interrupts can be hardware interrupts such as an io operation a printer or a keystroke for example the printer for example running out of you know pages while printing something it will generate an interrupt causing your screen to show an error message or whatever and you can handle that by hand and inserting more paper to the printer similarly every keystroke that i make on the keyboard is on an interrupt on known on its own and that is an io operation io interrupt software interrupts such as software requesting for services on os apart from that it could also mean that uh, my uh, what you call it yes my microsoft word for example microsoft word if i am using microsoft microsoft word right now and i hit the control c button control c as you remember sorry control s control s as you if you are you if you are aware of this the control s means that save the current work that is handling so basically i am sending a signal to microsoft word and microsoft word which is a software application software sends a signal to the os causing the current work to be saved in the hardware so that's another type of interrupt a software generated interrupt then we got the timer interrupt that is generated by an internal clock indicating that the processor must attend to time critical activities one of these time critical activities include switching between different processes that are in the memory so that all processes get their turn with the cpu all processes that are in the memory there can be multiple processes in the memory each process has to be given a time to the cpu and when it's time to switch between different processes the timer interrupt allows for that to happen so this is the end of this chapter so i hope that's clear now we will be sharing the notes as well